First, Charlene, thank you so much for leading us in those wonderful prayers that remind us that we have had one difficult week. Add to that my own anxiety to be in front of you guys this morning having to follow your previous preacher who happens to be my wife and who also happens to be uh, a professor of preaching at Baylor. And I will tell you, I'm feeling a little bit uh, uncertain this morning. Thank you guys so much for your historic witness in this community, for what Lakeshore Baptist Church means to the greater, greater Waco area, area. You are a blessing to us, and we take great hope and joy in being together this morning. I'm going to read a passage that seems a little bit too joyful, seems a little bit too happy. It's from Isaiah chapter 55, verses 1 through 13. And I'll say a little bit more about this later, but Isaiah 55 is a moment in this particular prophetic book where the people seem to be incredibly hopeful, joyful even, and given to utopian visions about what the future might look like. And I don't know about the rest of you guys, but that's not precisely the place that I'm in this morning. I would invite you to consider the fact that for the first people who heard this passage in Isaiah 55, that the passage was given to them, spoken to them, in a moment of tremendous, utter despair. For this is a prophetic word, a poetic word, that is given to a people who were in exile, away from home, and away from many of the things that they loved best. And so, if you would, please open with me to Isaiah chapter 55, verses 1 through 13. I invite you to hear this word of great hope in that context. Isaiah 55, 1 through 13. Ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you that have no money, come, buy, and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me, and eat what is good, and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me. Listen, so that you may live. I will make with you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love for David. See, I made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and commander for the peoples. See, you shall call nations that you do not know, and nations that do not know you shall run to you. Because of the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their way and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them return to the Lord that he may have mercy on them and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven, and do not return there until they have watered the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty." But it shall accomplish that which I purpose, and succeed in the thing for which I sent it. For you shall go out in joy, and be led back in peace. The mountains and the hills before you shall burst into song, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Instead of the thorn shall come up the cypress, instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle, and it shall be to the Lord for a memorial, for an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Happy little trees. That's what PBS personality and artist Bob Ross called them, and he's the first person I thought of when I heard Isaiah 55, 12. The trees of the field shall clap their hands. You all remember Bob, don't you? Okay, I see some nodding heads. We all remember Bob. Smiling, permed, friendly, non-threatening like all of the heroes of public broadcasting. 
Julia Child. This, I know that this is a congregation that, that thinks of the public broadcasting people as heroes. Maybe the only, the only thing I could do to get this congregation more excited would be to mention, you know, National Public Radio. Would that be right? It's the same at Calvary. We're big NPR fans. But the heroes of public broadcasting, which this group of people understands, truly are heroes. Julia Child, Rick Steves, Norm Abrams. Do you have any Norm Abrams fans out there? I know this is a Baptist church. You can amen if you love Norm Abrams. And, of course, our beloved Fred Rogers. You know the type. Bob Ross's calming show was just perfect for an afternoon nap. According to the book Happy Clouds, Happy Trees, the Bob Ross phenomenon, which I have not read but which Wikipedia tells me definitely exists, he hosted The Joy of Painting from 1983 to 1994, after which time his show ran for years and years in reruns And now it lives on on Amazon Prime. Ross wasn't a revolutionary artist. His work was almost always of some pastoral imagery. A field or a mountain with clouds, trees, a lake. Hilariously and inexplicably, Nate Silver's blog, 538.com, analyzed 381 episodes of The Joy of Painting. And they found that 91% of Ross's paintings contained at least one tree, 44% included clouds, 39% included mountains, and 34% included mountain lakes. It's an important distinction for some reason. A mountain lake, not just a regular lake. It was simple stuff. And yet there he was, week after week, a quiet, simple comfort to an American audience used to a laugh track and to a studio audience. Of course, Bob Ross's story is more complex, and just this week, if you're a Netflix fan, you may have seen that a new documentary has come out that problematizes some of the challenging sort of issues about Bob Ross's legacy. I've not watched it, but I'm certain that it gives us a much deeper look into who he was and and what he was about. But this morning, I think we can focus on his steadiness, or maybe the grace that he showed to himself and counseled for others. My sweet daughter, who did visit with you guys last week, but could not join me today because uh, she is making her choir debut, she heard me mention that I was going to mention Bob Ross today, and she said, well, don't leave out happy little mistakes. That's very important. You remember how he could goof something up, he'd make a mistake, and, and, and then he'd just move right along and just incorporate that into his art. What a beautiful picture of a way of living that we could all learn from. So Bob Ross was beloved, and at least 91% of the time, according to Nate Silver, who didn't have anything to do that week, he was joyfully painting happy little trees. Maybe a whole forest of them, or maybe just one little guy right over here in the corner. I've got no idea if Bob Ross was familiar with the Hebrew Bible or not, and I suppose you don't have to be to personify trees. It's not all that rare among artists and poets, both ancient and modern. I doubt he took inspiration from the book of Isaiah, but that doesn't mean that we can't. I think we should. And the passage that we read for this morning is an especially affecting and appropriate poem of joy for an exiled and a hopeless people. By which I mean not only Israel, but also the great saints of Lakeshore Baptist Church of Calvary Baptist Church and beyond. Maybe you're like me this morning. There's a lot to feel hopeless about. The Delta variant, anti-mask sentiment. Thank God for Waco ISD and the courage that Dr. King Cannon showed this week. I've got two kids in Midway ISD. We're praying for the same courage. Other things that are making me feel hopeless, hurricanes, Afghanistan, Vaccine resistance, these are things that have made me feel pretty hopeless. And I'm guessing I'm not the only one. And so you might think that, you know, me picking this passage feels like a bit of a mistake. I mean, read the room, Eggleston. But this is the morning that I need to hear this song of deliverance. It's the culmination of 16 chapters of comfort that began all the way back in chapter 40, the most joyful section of the book of Isaiah. 
which is really saying something. Before this part of the book, in chapters 1 through 39, Isaiah mostly speaks words of judgment and even doom on Israel, promising that the people of Israel will be exiled for their sin. Then after Isaiah 40 through 55, in chapters 56 through 66, the book of Isaiah seems to take on a tone of of more pragmatic hope, one tempered by how things really turned out when they came back from exile. But here, in what most scholars call Second Isaiah, with the clapping trees and the anticipation of good things ahead, the poet is given to near utopian visions of what the future may hold. After decades in Babylon, the people are going home. The poet prophet's joy practically leaps from the page. Ho, says the New Revised Standard Version to open the poem. Not a nod to jolly old St. Nicholas, but a Hebrew interjection, an utterance of exclamation to grab your attention. We can leave it untranslated. Hoy, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. Come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Come to me, the Lord says in verse 3. Come. The call to Israel is not only to be free or to go out from Babylon, but to go to something, somewhere, someone. Incline your ear, says the Lord, and come to me. Listen, so that you may live. The call to freedom here, then, is like the Exodus, where Pharaoh was told to let the people go so that they could worship the Lord on the Lord's holy mountain. Freedom is not absolute, but is instead deeply tied to the abundant life that God can give, where everyone's needs are satisfied and God establishes an everlasting covenant with God's people. When Israel goes, they will go not only out of a place with joy, but to God. Jesus spoke similarly in Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. I don't know about the rest of you, but I could use a little bit of rest. Not just sleep, although I definitely could use some of that, and I will definitely be taking a Sunday afternoon nap, but rest from stress, rest from pandemic planning, Everybody says, don't they, oh, we're just over it, we're just tired of it, but we can't afford to stop being vigilant, and we need rest from that. Rest from the world's absolute brokenness. And the only way to get that kind of rest is to come to God, to rest in the fact that God has control in spite of appearances to the contrary. And so the Lord says in Isaiah in the Hebrew Bible, and then Jesus says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened. You might say, if you look at this passage, if I were going to do something very dangerous and use an analogy from physics, that there is a sort of centripetal force at play in Isaiah 55. Now, I know that Bible nerds like me aren't supposed to pretend to be scientists, but that hasn't stopped me before, and I'm certainly not going to let it Stop me now. Dear Lakeshore friends, Dr. McMichael, Mandy once heard me on a Zoom meeting opining on the price of hay as part of a discussion about McLennan Community College's agriculture program. And she asked me incredulously, is there anything you don't have an opinion about? The answer then, as now, is no. (laughs) And if you'd like to hear my thoughts on the production of hay at the Highlander Ranch, I'm happy to share that with you later. But back to basic physics in the Bible. Centripetal force acts on a body moving in a circular motion to draw it to the center. So if I had a rock tied on a string and I twirled it above my head like so, my hand would be applying centripetal force to keep the rock moving around the center. Physics profs and postdocs in the room and or at home, I assume that you will tell me later precisely how I've gotten this wrong. Be gentle with me, please. The center in this analogy is God in Jerusalem, 
to which the people of Israel are going to come. And God is calling in Jerusalem to his people to come to him. This centripetal force is so strong in Isaiah that not only Israel, but all nations will come to God on Mount Zion. A radical idea at the time. Biblical scholars, of course, have an unimaginative name for this set of ideas. Zion theology, we like to call it. Because the nations will come to God on the holy mountain Zion. The point is a simple one, and no flimsy analogy from my poor recollection of high school physics should get in the way. God is calling us to him, inviting us into God's peaceable kingdom, radically welcoming all who will simply heed the call to come. Now, if we're like Israel, we may well think that even if we do come to God, we've simply done too much to be welcome. The world has told us that we're not welcome or good enough. For any reason. Remember that for Isaiah, you need only turn back a few pages to the first two thirds of the book to see God's just and certain judgment on the people. Isaiah, Israel, and the Lord all knew that they deserved exactly what they had gotten. And maybe that's how you feel today. You don't even have to read the Bible to recall your mistakes. But friends, hear the good news which came as loud and clear to Israel in the Old Testament as it comes to the disciples through Jesus in the New. God wants to forgive, and indeed God will forgive, because his ways, God's ways, are not our ways. God's thoughts are not our thoughts. Our only job is to return to the Lord so that he can have mercy on us. To return to God, as verse 7 tells us, for God abundantly pardons. This may well not only be good news, it may be the very best news that I could give you this morning. We worship a forgiving God who wants us to come so that we might go out with joy. Let me say that again. We serve a forgiving God, a gracious God, who wants us to come to God so that we might go out with joy. Even on a morning like this, That is good and even great news. For Israel, this pardon was made manifest in their ability to go home. They may have wondered whether God's forgiveness could really stand in a world bent upon not allowing Israel to go back. But our poem and our prophet reminds us that God's word, like the rain, yields what God purposes it to yield. It doesn't return empty. And we know from 6th century geopolitics of the day that the Persians... Cyrus in particular, called the Messiah in Isaiah 45, would have allowed Israel to return. But the Hebrew Bible understands this not as a strategic decision on the part of the Persian emperor, although it was that, but more importantly as the effective word of God and the tangible effect of God's forgiveness of Israel. If God wills it, whatever the need may be, we may be certain that it will happen. If God wants to forgive us and deliver us, as the passage tells us God wants to do, God will do it. Like Israel, we find ourselves in a moment of deep and abiding, it seems, uncertainty. We're in need of deliverance. And perhaps we are being delivered? Who knows? The very fact that we are here with many of us, I hope most of us, vaccinated, is a hopeful sign that the pandemic in which we have been living may not hold its grip forever. Although the Delta variant has severely tampered our cautious optimism. How many of us listened as Charlene told us to Mayor Meek's press conference this week? We were looking ahead to something new, a return to normal, or whatever it is that we will call normal, but it's hard to see that horizon now. How will we make sense of all that we have been through together? Lakeshore Baptist, you are looking ahead to a new day with a new pastor. Won't it be wonderful to go to church and hear a consistent sermon from someone who does this professionally on a weekly basis and not a dilettante like me? And yet you wonder, will church ever be the same as it once was? How have the past two years changed us who will we welcome as our new pastor and how will they lead us whatever our answers to these questions 
we may rest assured with Israel that God has been and will continue to be working in this place in the days, months, and years to come. God's purposes have been wrought among us. We are forgiven, and we will be ready to go out into the freedom to which God has called us in spite of the challenges of these days. This too shall pass, thank God. And what does that going look like, going out look like, with the mountains and the hills bursting into song? And yes, the trees of the field clapping their hands. Happy little trees indeed. Happy because God's forgiveness had really freed the people of Israel. And happy again because God wants to free us to come to him. This morning, we may have to dig deeply to imagine what clapping trees might sound like or look like. We might not be singing verbally, but God knows our hearts and can hear us even when the wise course of action is not to sing. How many of you have heard of the worship protests that have been taking place in California and across the country by a so-called Christian minister who has protested by singing unmasked worship songs in public spaces at state capitals and elsewhere? as if God needs to hear us verbally to know that we're worshiping God, as if God wants us to put ourselves at risk for God's purposes. No, friends, God knows, God hears and sees our joy even when we can't verbally uh, express it through our words. And so going out with joy is not only something that's possible here, but it's also something that we can do with wonder and excellence. You may think going out with joy is a silly or a small thing, but I'm here to tell you that it is not. Because when we leave this place, we are going out to a world that needs to see our joy, not a false, sticky, sweet sentimentality or a plastic smile, but real joy, the kind of joy that is honest about the situation we find ourselves in, but chooses hope nonetheless. The kind of joy that recognizes God's forgiving nature comes to God and then later goes out to the nations and welcomes them into life abundant. Such a welcome needn't be false. It can be deeply honest about the situation we find ourselves in, our deep need for God, our occasional hopelessness, our occasional hopefulness, and the possibility of a future with God's help. As you go then, Lakeshore Baptist Church, remember these words. Come to the Lord. The Lord forgives abundantly. You shall go out with joy. It's simple. Just act like the happy little trees you see in Isaiah 55. Let us pray. Gracious God, you've invited us to come to you. You have told us that in spite of all appearances, there is great joy available in your presence. Lord, here at Lakeshore and in our community, help us to find that true joy, to step into those spaces where we can be hope, where it seems that there is none. In the name of the Creator, Sustainer, and Redeemer, we pray. Amen. Dear friends, we are a people of great joy and a people of great hope. And so now I say to you this morning and for the rest of this week, go out now in joy and in peace, like the happy little trees of Isaiah 55. God bless you as you go.